and a family desperate for her return. We need you. We love you. Please, just, just come home. What happened to Shelby Wilkie? Sheriff's detectives believe Wilkie left her house at 7 a.m. Her husband believes she may be struggling with postpartum depression. And what secrets was she keeping? She said, Michael and I got in a fight, and he grabbed me, and he leaned me over a table. I think I passed out. And I turned around to my husband, and I said, she ran. I know she ran. But clues point to something more sinister. There was actually a silhouette of a human body slumped against the wall. Police circle in. Just let it go. Just let it go. But the mystery remains. There was no body, no mortal weapon, no, no DNA whatsoever. Was she missing or murdered? Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Shelby Wilkie had always been the kind of woman to take control of her life. She'd always had a plan. And finally, the pieces were all in place. Career husband, and a brand new baby girl. So when she vanished one January day, the question was, had she been planning that too? And if so, why? As Matt Gutman first reported in 2015, it turned out her perfect life wasn't so perfect after all. And Shelby was in a desperate race to escape before it was too late. New Year's Eve. A time for new beginnings and new hope. Happy new Year. In the first moments of 2012, while these revelers throng Times Square, Shelby, cute, cute. 38-year-old Shelby Wilkie was having a much quieter evening in a much quieter place, 700 miles south in Asheville, North Carolina. All of New Year's and into the evening was wonderful. We were together and we were happy and just it just was a great time. At the stroke of midnight, Shelby is at home with her husband, Michael. That's them sharing a tender moment in this home video. They'd connected on an online dating site. He was tall, dark, and handsome. She was excited about this guy. He was a great catch, oh, right? Oh, yeah. And I think she called him a Prince Charming at one time. She goes, it's like a Prince Charming. Look at all he does for me, you know, and he's great. A portrait of stability. Wilkie's held down the same job for 16 years in manufacturing. He owns a home, a regular guy who loves the Atlanta Falcons and fantasy football. Yeah, she goes, he's got to be a great guy. They live in this two-bedroom ranch in a cul-de-sac on Moody Street, where Christmas has come early. Baby Sydney is born. The daughter Shelby had always wanted. Carried her everywhere, wanted to be with her, regretted really having to go to work. She missed her so much, and... She just was in love with Sydney. She wanted to be married. She wanted a family. That was her whole goal in life. Shelby has met that goal and surpassed it. While building a family, she is also building a career. Asheville's Mix. Today's best variety. Mix 96.5. As a business manager at 96.5 Asheville Radio Group. Good morning. It's Tammy and Dex with you. What was she like as a business manager? She was very professional. She could be stern. She didn't take slack from anybody. She was a very strong person. Shelby's parents, Jan and Bill Sprouse, say she's been that way since she was in diapers. You knew she was in the room. A force of nature. Yes. yes mm -hmm. Absolutely. Shelby liked to be in charge. Here she is leading the singing at her own birthday party. Happy birthday to you. Your parents describe your sister as the cruise director. Yeah, she kept things organized, kept things on task. She had everything set up, and all we had to do was show up, basically. Here's Thomas now. New Year's Day is a Sunday, and the Oregon Ducks are playing the Wisconsin Badgers in the Rose Bowl, while Jan Sprouse texts Shelby, checking in on her daughter and the new baby. I texted her and said, are you okay? And a text came back, yes. It is the last time they will ever hear from her. Sunday and Monday, I was just calling and calling, and I got into a panic of, you know, why she wouldn't pick up. And it's just not like her, because I hear, I hear from her all the time. The swelling anxiety turns the minutes into hours. I couldn't get through to her cell phone anymore because it had been turned off. I had a very, very bad instinct that something had happened to Shelby. One of my coworkers walks into an office and she says, Shelby's missing. I'm like, stop kidding around. He's not missing. She goes, no, really. Her mom's been trying to get a hold of her and she says she can't reach her. Well, that's bizarre. 
Monday evening, still no word from Shelby. So Shelby's father and brother head over to the house on Moody Street to see what's up. I asked Michael if he knew where Shelby was because we haven't heard from her all day, which is strange. But the day started normally, says Michael, who told them she drove to work that morning in her 2012 Ford Escape. So he picked up a cell phone um, and called her work saying, yeah, I'm right here with Bill. He's in the, in the driveway looking for you. Hey, honey, it's me. I'm standing in the yard with Bill and people's trying to get hold of you and you're not returning any calls and stuff. Just uh, call somebody back and let somebody know something. Okay? I love you, honey. Actually, he left a series of messages himself on her office voicemail. Hey, honey, it's me. I can't wait to see you later. Love you, babe. Hey honey, it's me. I was just calling to say how your day was going. I hadn't heard from you. He also called his buddy, Mark McMinn. He just said that, he, that she'd run off and left, but uh, she just went, went to work and didn't come back home. After two more hours of radio silence, Bill makes a call of his own. Henderson County 911. Yes, ma'am. Um, my daughter's been missing since uh, noon yesterday. Shelby's car is gone as is the Tiffany bracelet her mother recently gave her. She never left home without it. We were all out looking. I mean, just, just didn't know what else to do. Henderson County authorities are searching for a woman who left home early yesterday morning and hasn't been seen since. Of course, the vanishing of Shelby Wilkie causes the cops to consider foul play. That's where Detective Sonia Matthews enters the picture. This was a true missing persons case, and my gut just said, no, this is really serious. How are you feeling? You don't have to have seen the hit movie Gone Girl to know that when a wife goes missing, the cop's Take first questions are who the husband. We understand there are concerns about your wife. I don't know where my wife is. The patrol officer came here to check things out. They didn't see anything. Right. Michael Wilkie invites the officers into the house. And then we ask him, do you mind if we look around? And he was fine with it. He said, absolutely, no problem. He answers all of their questions. Little Sydney was sitting on, a, on the coffee table in her car seat. And he invited us to sit down and talk to him right here in the front room. Um, I remember he took little Sydney out and was holding her. Behavior in keeping with his reputation as a down-to-earth mountain man. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. He didn't swear. A good old country boy yeah. that had been here his whole life. That's why the Sprouse embraced their new son-in-law. Here's the clan in happier times, opening oh, presents on Christmas Day. Perfect. I love it. Stuff in here. Family, husband, job, baby. If Shelby Wilkie has it all right here in Asheville, then where has she gone? Michael now goes on TV, desperate for answers. Just like in Gone Girl, he's the Ben Affleck pleading for his Rosamund Pike to come home. I love my wife so much. We have a daughter together. I mean, we have a wife together. I mean, just want her to come home. We need you. We love you. Please, just, just come home. Michael suggests the new mom had emotional problems after giving birth. Her husband believes she may be struggling with postpartum depression. As Detective Matthews works the case, she learns that the mystery's first clues are to be found in moments not captured on home video. Probably a mess here. When they come to light, they reveal a young mother who made a secret New Year's resolution. And another woman convinced she knows why this girl had gone. And I turned around to my husband and I said, she ran. I know she ran. Stay with us. Asheville, North Carolina, where rolling emerald pastures give way to the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's consistently voted one of the best and happiest places to live in America. But for Shelby Wilkie's family, it has become a wasteland of work. Well, they want some answers regarding where Shelby Wilkie was headed. Sheriff's detectives believe Wilkie left her house at 7 a.m. We were all out with flyers, and it was a picture of Shelby and Sydney, and, you know, can you help me find my mommy? It was really hard on everybody. I mean, we all started to get really worried. Police join them. Choppers hunt the skies. Scuba divers comb the riverbeds. So I remember tapping every resource we could. The state highway police and their helicopter, cadaver dog, search and rescue teams were employed. The results? 
nothing. They say they need some leads to help find her. Local news stations, including our affiliate WLOS, elicit tips from the public. Sightings of a brunette woman at the wheel of a black Ford Escape. A similar vehicle parked in front of this pawn shop. A woman matching Shelby's description in the checkout line at Walmart. We took all of them serious and we investigated all of them. 4 p.m. Wednesday, January 4th. Two days after Shelby is reported missing, the black escape is found in the parking lot of the J&S cafeteria across the road from the Asheville Regional Airport. 90 miles away in this woman's head, an alarm bell starts blaring. Shelby's on the run. They said that she might have flown out of the airport. So I think, oh, well, she got, she really got away. Amanda Casey was Michael Wilkie's wife before Shelby. That marriage had produced a beautiful daughter and plenty of happy memories. You guys got dressed up. He was a Confederate officer. You were a Southern belle. Looks like fun. It was. Did you guys have laughs while you were doing this? Sure. So you had a good sense of humor. Definitely. Very charismatic. But like the Confederacy, Amanda's marriage eventually became a lost cause. Because he was so good at masking. It was like Jekyll and Hyde, two personalities, and you didn't know which one you would get. How nice was the Dr. Jekyll? Very nice. And the Mr. Hyde? Terrible. Not somebody you'd want to meet. It was like um, his eyes went dark and his facial expression, he had none. You guys had a pretty big argument when you were pregnant with the daughter you had with him. Mm -hmm. The argument escalated and he was physically abusive. What does that mean, physically abusive? Um, he grabbed me around my throat and slung me around our bedroom and my shoulder went through and made that hole in the sheetrock in the bedroom. She never filed charges and she says the psychological abuse left a far bigger dent. So one night she decided to flee even though it meant leaving her three-year-old daughter behind. The only way that you thought you could actually get away was if you didn't take your daughter. That must have been a gut-wrenching decision. I had determined that I would let the court system take care of that and get her back that way. Years later, Amanda learned that Michael was with Shelby. Did you wonder if she knew what you knew about this dark side? I had hoped, I always try to think positive, and I had hoped that things had changed. The wife had changed, but the husband, unfortunately, well, he was pretty much the same. Though Michael had presented himself as a gentle dog lover on his online dating profile, Shelby's parents say his behavior told a different story. Shelby had her dog, Cody, that, you know, she adored. And um, I think it would be about the first week or so they got married, she called me in a panic and said that Kobe was missing. And she had called Michael, and he seemed concerned, and oh my goodness, and I think it was the next day or so that a lady called her and said that she thinks she may have her dog. And um, she explained to her that her husband is a truck driver and had been coming home and saw uh, somebody trying to push a dog out of a truck and thought the dog was being abandoned. This lady's uh, husband described Michael's truck exactly and described him, the person he saw push the dog out. A week later, Shelby files for a restraining order and more of Michael's unattractive personality traits are revealed. Shelby said Michael attempted to restrain me from leaving for work, tried to forcefully remove my wedding ring from my finger, broke my fingernail, door of car, and scratched my arm. So she was beginning to see after marriage things that she had not seen before. Still, Shelby immediately dropped the charges and kept the abuse a secret. Why did she go back? Because Shelby was a very loving, <clears throat> believing, trusting feel. person. He had an ability to cry and to beg and to, um, I love you, this was a mistake. And so he could turn his emotions on a dime. Yes. Oh, completely. Just mm -hmm. a very master at mm -hmm. manipulation. And apparently he was also a master at trying to control Shelby's social life. We're radio people. We go right. out and we, you know, go out and have dinner together. You know, we have celebrations and stuff. He wouldn't let her go. She wasn't allowed to go. There was only one event that we went to that he showed up, but she couldn't walk more than like two feet away from him. She made, he made or sure she what? was right there. He would pull her back. It's like, really? <laughs> but she didn't want to fight. She didn't want an argument. So she listened to him. The mood on Moody Street was growing grimmer by the day. 
The Wilkie home was becoming Shelby's two-bedroom hell. They fought about what everybody fights about, money. He wanted to split the check with her when they went out to dinner as a married couple. Yes. He had her, she had to pay half of his house payment, half of the utility bills. But Shelby hid the worst from her parents. I think she was afraid if she told her dad and her brothers everything, they would have tracked him down, hunted him down. Yeah. And she didn't want anything bad to happen to Michael, which is really sad because bad things should have happened to Michael. But there were some things no amount of cover-up could hide. And I said, where did you get the bruises on your neck? And she said, Michael and I got in a fight. And he grabbed me and he leaned me over a table. I think I passed out. Why didn't you call somebody? She goes, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay. He didn't mean to. In truth, Shelby was far from okay. And six months into the marriage, she called the cops again. The warrant says Shelby had bruises and cuts on her face and hands. Michael grabbed her and threw her down when she reached for an alarm keypad. This time, Michael was charged with assault. He avoided jail time by agreeing to attend anger management classes at Main State, a domestic violence prevention agency. Eight months later, they welcomed a new life, their daughter Sydney, and Shelby hoped a new start. But just 11 days after the birth, another call to police. This time, the tables have turned. It's Michael complaining about Shelby. 911. Is this a sign of postpartum depression or just a fight? In any event, Shelby goes to attorney Greg Newman to draw up a separation agreement. The separation agreement as a legal tool in our state is very popular with people. Uh, it can avoid a lot of litigation costs and the stress of going through uh, a court battle for many months. And so she wanted to avoid being adversarial with her husband at that time for fear of how he would react. There was a plan to move her to an undisclosed home and they were going to do this around the first of the year. Shelby even rents this secret safe house and prepares to disappear when Michael's at work. Then a couple of months before the vanishing, she makes a cryptic phone call to, of all people, Michael's ex, Amanda. And she said, I just want to ask you some things about Michael. Is that okay? And I said, Shelby, if there's anybody that knows what you're going through, it's me. And I said, I can't talk to you right now. I've got an appointment I've got to get to. But I said, please call me back. I literally slept with my cell phone. That next call never comes. The next time Amanda hears Shelby's name, it is on the TV news. 38-year-old Shelby Wilkie is a new mother. And her ex-husband's teary plea for Shelby to come on home. We need you. We love you. Please, just, just come home. And I just sat there and just sat there and looked. Did you think maybe she got away? Maybe yeah. she finally did it. Amanda is convinced that history has repeated itself. Michael Wilkie's abuse has driven another wife to flee at any cost, even if it means leaving a child behind. And I turned around to my husband and I said, she ran. I know she ran. But Shelby hasn't turned up at that safe house or anywhere else for that matter. And now, Shelby's family and Detective Matthews see something scarier. Take another look at Michael's weepy press conference. This one hurts the most. Do you see what they see? Stay with us. Thirty-eight-year-old wife and mother Shelby Wilkie has disappeared. So far, there have been a host of theories on why she might have left, but few real leads. That is, until detectives notice one small detail that'll focus this investigation on one person. Once again, here's Matt Gutman. In the Wilkie house on Moody Street, the dishes are unwashed, the laundry unfolded, and little baby Sydney is without her mother. Was this a postpartum meltdown? Or perhaps she ran to escape a miserable marriage? The discovery of her car at the local airport had some people suspecting as much, but Shelby's parents had been suspecting something much worse. I felt something was really wrong, and I went to Bill, and I said, something's not right. 
something is really not right. That gnawing fear had begun back on Sunday, New Year's Day, 24 hours before they reported her missing. And it was all because of those final text messages. I texted her and said, are you okay? And a text came back, yes. And I, I the blood drained from my body for some reason. I had a, the worst feeling I can ever imagine. Why? Because it was just yes. She would never say just yes. What would she write? She would either say, I'll call you in a minute, love you. She would tell me more. The Sprouse knew Shelby's marriage to Michael Wilkie was on the rocks. They had even helped Shelby set up that secret safe house. So when her phone went dark, they started to panic. If you felt something was so wrong, why not just go over there? Up until this point, I mean, we didn't, there was not, you know, danger, danger. I don't think normal people think, well, maybe he's, you know, really hurt her bad and she can't communicate. When Bill finally did swing by the house Monday, Michael had assured him that Shelby had left for work safe and sound Monday morning. He'd even left messages for her there. Hey, honey, it's me. I was just calling to see how your day was going. I hadn't heard from me. Hopefully you're not working too hard. And he cooperated fully with Detective Sonia Matthews when she came out to the house on Tuesday. So it was just about noon when you drove down this street for the first time? Yes. Did you see anything suspicious? No. He walked up here, he answered the door. He said, sure, come right on in. Again, Michael's attitude is that of a bereft husband, the guy who wept on TV, baby Sydney in his arms. <laughs> Just want her to come home. But the detectives couldn't help but notice what the camera also did, those scratch marks on Michael's face. We see what appears to be scratch marks around his eyes and on his cheek. And it's Indicative just of a struggle, maybe. Quite possibly. It's just, uh, just too suspicious. So the cops comb the house, looking for anything incriminating. They look in drains for blood or cleaning fluid, in closets, in storage containers. We looked everywhere that, that a human body could be. We didn't see anything suspicious. But now the detective is starting to think Michael's relationship with the truth is as troubled as his relationship with Shelby. For starters, his story about Shelby going to work on Monday, that was January 2nd, the New Year's holiday. It did not hold water when we looked into it because that was a holiday. It was a scheduled holiday for Shelby's place of employment. There would have been no reason for Shelby to go into the office. As for the theory that Shelby may have fled to escape her crumbling marriage, well, immediately after leaving the house on Moody Street, Matthews checks Shelby's bank and phone records. There had been absolutely no activity on her cell phone since Sunday evening, and there had been no other activity on her bank account. That tells us she really didn't plan on doing anything because she hadn't prepared for it or had the means to travel anywhere. We made a point to look at all the things Shelby might have taken with her had she decided to leave or go on an unannounced trip overnight. Her toothbrush was there, her makeup was there, her personal hygiene items were there. Um, she really had taken nothing with her. And while it's true that Shelby's Ford Escape is found Wednesday near the airport, police also find this. After we observed what we thought was Shelby's car turned into the parking lot within approximately a minute's time. We see this figure continue to walk purposefully. That figure is impossible to identify, but it sure isn't Shelby. We picked up a different camera. We see them approach the side of the taxi and get into the last taxi in the row. That taxi leaves and exits the airport. Michael voluntarily accepts a request to come in for a polygraph. He fails miserably. I could not give Michael a grade on his polygraph, but I would say that based on the fact that he showed clear signs of deception when he took the polygraph, we knew that he was hiding something from us. And yet, when a cadaver dog sniffs through Shelby's car and Michael's truck, nothing. There's still no sign of the missing mom, dead or alive. At that time, we did not find anything significant. By Wednesday afternoon, the team is back at the Wilkie home with a search warrant and again, mirroring the movie Gone Girl. Our guys did a luminol test, and I'm sorry to tell you, but that kitchen lit up. They brought luminol, the chemical solution which can detect the presence of blood even after it's been cleaned up. When you turned out the lights, you sprayed everything with luminol, what did you see here? About right in here, 
there was actually the silhouette of a human body slumped against the wall and you could just you could see the knees you could see the hips you could see the shoulders you could see the head and it just looked like a human body that had slumped as if, as if in death it is the eureka moment of the investigation did that affect you seeing that silhouette of a body slumped against the wall here? It was shocking. Um, I think what affected me even more than seeing it was the reaction of seasoned SBI agents that were in the room. They were shocked as well. It's just something nobody had ever seen before. And by Thursday, cops still haven't found Shelby Wilkie, but they sure have more questions for Michael Wilkie. He had done something with her, and our goal at that point was to try to figure out exactly what he did. When we come back... I mean, I mean honestly, I, I don't know. Michael Wilkie in the box and on the hot seat. Turning on the waterworks once again. And. You're not the only one we're looking at, okay? Is another suspect about to emerge? He told me if I ever sit there and told anybody about that, that he would kill me. Stay with us. Three days of investigation, Shelby Wilkie is still missing. Detectives sure suspect Michael Wilkie murdered her, but there's no body, and they aren't ready to arrest him. So now comes the moment of truth. First of all, thanks for coming in and chatting with me. At 4.11 in the afternoon, Thursday, January 5th, Michael Wilkie volunteers to come into the Henderson County Sheriff's Office and submit to what will be about six hours of questioning from Sergeant Andrew Anderson. He's a master interrogator. He wanted to be there, it seemed like, and he was ready to talk. Up to now, Wilkie has been so cooperative, maybe he really is innocent. Or is he just convinced he can talk his way out of the quicksand? Legal analyst Nancy Grace has studied the case. Michael Wilkie is painting himself into a corner with his own words, okay? Are you a baseball fan? I'm crazy. The interrogation begins with some ice-breaking small talk. But I love, absolutely love the Atlanta Braves. I've been a baseball fan and a Braves fan all my life. I was creating a bond with him. I wanted him to feel comfortable enough to me to be able to tell the truth about what happened to his wife. Obviously, we need to find your wife. I know that. There's no doubt. We need to find her. Detective Sonia Matthews is watching from down the hall as Anderson reveals to Wilkie the cops have pretty much eliminated the runaway theory. Your cell phone is ended on January 1st. Where we ended. There's no activity. There's been no activity with her three bank accounts that we know of. Found her car. Haven't found her. Doesn't look good. But he assures Wilkie he's not the only suspect. You're not the only one we're looking at, okay? And so Wilkie immediately offers up someone else. I'm trying, I'm trying to be mean. Did you know about her mom's problem? Um, no. Tell me about her mom. He thinks if he can just keep talking, he can outwit everybody. He starts pointing the finger at her own parents. He claims Jan had some legal trouble and that Bill demanded that he keep his mouth shut. He told me if I ever sit there and told anybody about that, that he would kill me. So her dad threatened you? Her, yeah. The parents admit there was some minor real estate problem a long time ago, but say it was absurd to suggest they threaten Michael. He's trying to pass the blame to someone else. And I let him do that. But Anderson returns the focus to Wilkie, zeroing in now on that key question everyone wanted answered. How did he get those scratches on his face? This is a hallway. The master bedroom is back in this area, and there's like a half bath. They go through New Year's Day hour by hour, drawing where Shelby and Michael were in the house, and slowly Anderson gets Wilkie to abandon that theory that Shelby ran off. He chose where the crime scene was without me even taking him there. He pointed that, that position out. Well, it, it actually started in the kitchen. Wilkie begins describing an argument in that kitchen that moves to the bathroom and then to the bedroom. He admits to a physical altercation. He admitted to that. First, Wilkie says Shelby hit him. What did she do? I mean, you're showing me with your hands. Tell she me what she did. Like she was trying to fall and that's how you got the, the scratches and the wood on the side. But there's more. Anderson extracting the truth like sap from a North Carolina maple. For the first time, Wilkie admits he hit Shelby. I mean, I pushed her back, and I'm just kind of like, just cut, stop. You know, she's like, you know, 
Oh, I think, I think my nose is bleeding. When people start admitting things such as she had a bloody nose, they feel like they're not incriminating themselves, but you know the truth. The closer to the truth, the more emotional Loki gets. He weeps and yelps, but still denies killing Shelby. He has no idea where she is. The weight of your throat is on your shoulder. How did she die? How did she die? How did she die? What happened in there? Tell me. Tell me. But he's about to learn just how much evidence the detectives have already. For example, remember that luminol? The chemical that shows blood spatter even after it's been cleaned up? I'm telling you what's been found there last night. On this wall, there is basically an outline of a human body that had been on the knees up against the wall in human blood. Nobody knows causes that. Can you not tell that we know what they're going to I didn't take and kill her. You didn't take and kill her. What? No, I didn't. Where did all that blood come from then? There's a Hail Mary. He says she committed suicide. <laughs> This is all strictly a show. So why didn't he call 911? Why didn't he try to help Shelby? His story isn't adding up, especially in light of this Molotov cocktail of the revelation. So you guys came out here, and one of the officers noticed this big black patch right in there. Right. The cops have discovered that Bookie set a large bonfire in his backyard. Right about where that bird feeder's at is where they saw this perfect rectangle that had been burned in the yard. About the size of a human body, it really raised our suspicions immediately when we saw it. But they still don't know where Wilkie disposed of the ashes from that fire. Basically over there, you notice something that makes you stop and think for a second. Correct. But now, 5 p.m. that afternoon, just a few miles from where Wilkie is answering questions at the sheriff's office, the investigation now leads to his parents' house, where Detective Scott Galloway is walking up a winding gravel drive in the Blue Ridge foothills, searching for the remains of Wilkie's bonfire. He's texting Detective Anderson every step of the way, particularly what he sees as he turns the corner. When we come on down the driveway here, we see what appears to us as fresh tire tracks cutting down the field. The lone tire tracks lead detectives to a 55-gallon barrel in the woods. Inside the barrel? Uh, some of them were dumped out. Ashes, some small fragments yes. of bone. Suspicious, to say the least, but the fire has burned off all DNA traces. There's no way to identify whose bones these were. Back in the interrogation room, Detective Anderson reveals what's been found. But instead of a confession, the mountain man spins his tallest tale. He says he granted his beloved wife a final wish. It's hard to hear, but even harder to believe. He says he cremated her body after the suicide, then cleaned up to preserve her memory. How is she in the burning barrel? Yeah, the, the barrel is just whatever things didn't take and been burned. Okay, that is wrong on so many levels, I hardly even know where to start. His Oscar-worthy performance is rewarded with twin bracelets. What is this? He's charging you with one count of murder? 9 p.m. Thursday night, four days after his wife Shelby vanishes, Michael Wilkie is arrested and cuffed. But this case is no layup. There was no body. We had, uh, yeah, no murder weapon. We really don't know how the homicide occurred. What would a jury make of all this at trial? Is that why Michael Wilkie is smiling? Even giving the thumbs up after the verdict? Stay with us. He's charged with killing his wife and then burning her body. Investigators aren't saying exactly what they think happened. The arrest of Michael Wilkie for the gruesome murder of his wife, Shelby, a new mother, was a stunner to his friends. It was a shock. It was a, it was a total surprise to me. And anguish for her family. It kind of confirmed our worst fears and uh, we were all devastated. But if the arrest came quickly, 
the trial did not. Three years passed before Michael Wilkie's day in court arrived in January 2015. The trial of a man accused of killing his wife in Henderson County started today. With Greg Newman prosecuted the case. Have you ever seen a case like this? I have not. As fate would have it, Newman had played a previous role in this story. Remember back when she was hatching her plan to ditch Michael and escape to that safe house? He was the divorce lawyer she had gone to see about drawing up papers. She actually came to you just a few days before she was killed. This was a lady that uh, clearly needed help. Despite an avalanche of circumstantial evidence, the prosecution lacked concrete proof. There was no body, no murder weapon. No, no DNA whatsoever. Remember, Michael never confessed to the murder, and those ashes and bones found on his parents' property were never identified as Shelby's remains. But then, Newman presented Shelby's parents with a discovery that changed everything. We were called in shortly before the trial by Greg Newman, and he pulled out a charred bracelet and asked if we recognized it, and right away I did. It's what I gave Shelby. That beloved Tiffany bracelet, Shelby never took it off. And it was the only shred of proof really connecting Shelby to the remains. Yes. How significant was linking the bracelet to the murder? Very significant because in this uh, day and age, juries expect and want to see some type of forensic proof. Now armed with that proof, Newman lays out the story of what really happened to Shelby Wilkie. January 1st, Shelby's New Year's resolution to leave Michael taking baby Sydney with her leads to a physical altercation and those scratches on Wilkie's face. The luminal test indicates what happened next. Michael Wilkie savagely killed his wife while baby Sydney was in the next room. As her family tries to reach her later that day, it's actually Michael texting those replies on her phone. I especially love it when defendants get a hold of their victim's cell phone and text in their place. That night, he drags his dead wife through the house, out to the backyard, where he incinerates her body in that suspicious bonfire. Clearly, to uh, burn a body uh, where there's little uh, to nothing left, it would have to be a fire of some uh, impressive size. To cover up the crime, he scrubs the house spotless and later drives a barrel of charred remains to the back of his parents' property. But he still has to explain Shelby's disappearance, so he concocts the runaway theory by driving Shelby's car to the airport early Monday morning. That's him in the security camera footage. You see a figure right here approaching the taxi cab stand. To mask his role in Shelby's vanishing, Wilkie then leaves those concerned voicemails at her office on Monday. I was trying to get hold of you, and you're not returning any calls and stuff. Just uh, call somebody back and let somebody know something. The performance capped off by those crocodile tears shed for the TV cameras that Wednesday. Baby Sydney front and center, Wilkie pushes the runaway theory on the public. If she doesn't feel like taking and, and reaching out to somebody, you know, then Nobody can help her if there's something going on. When you look at the clip of Wilkie begging for his wife's safe return and you see his hands on her little baby, Sydney, to think those murderous hands holding that little baby, it made my skin crawl. As for the defense's case, Wilkie's lawyer stuck to the improbable story that Wilkie had tried to sell during his interrogation after the cops had literally reduced the runaway theory to ashes. Shelby committed suicide. The jury's judgment was swift and sure. They returned with a verdict in just 32 minutes, finding Michael Wilkie guilty of first degree murder. Michael Wilkie was sentenced to life without parole. And then Michael Wilkie does something inexplicable. He gives a thumbs up sign as he goes off to spend the rest of his life in prison. We felt very satisfied to get this conviction. We felt that we had achieved uh, justice for Shelby and uh, that we brought some measure of closure uh, for this, this really wonderful family. There was a feeling of joy and uh, happiness that that he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison i'm glad he is where he is you know he's still living and breathing 
getting three meals a day. And Shelby is, doesn't have her daughter and Sydney doesn't have her mom. For her family, what happened to Shelby is a tragic reminder of the horrors of domestic abuse. I think there's a misconception that, you know, abuse is, has to be physical. Um, and it really doesn't. I mean, and you can see how fast it escalates from just mental abuse and maybe control or jealousy to murder. We're hoping that when other women who may be in a bad situation see Shelby's story, that that will help them um, make the decision to get out of a, a bad situation. The family has now focused on the welfare of little Sydney, inspired by a heartbreaking note they discovered, Shelby writing her newborn daughter. I have been dreaming of holding you for a long time, and now my dreams have come true. You are the most beautiful little girl I've ever seen, and you are my precious angel. Sydney, now three years old, is in the process of being adopted by Shelby's brother, Bill. I love you, Daddy. I love you, too. And his wife, Stacy. They have no plans to take her for a visit with her father in prison. He doesn't deserve to ever see her beautiful face. To have her has been the easiest, greatest thing in the world. Shelby referred to her as her angel. And we all feel she really is a little angel because she's kept our family together and given us reason to smile. <laughs> Love you. Love you. As of 2015, Michael Wilkie is appealing his conviction. Shelby's family reports Sydney's last name has already been changed and she's doing well. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on I and a family desperate for her return. We need you. We love you. Please just, just come home. What happened to Shelby Wilkie? Sheriff's detectives believe Wilkie left her house at 7 a.m. The husband believes she may be struggling with postpartum depression. And what secrets was she keeping? She said, Michael and I got in a fight, and he grabbed me, and he leaned me over a table. I think I passed out. I turned around to my husband, and I said, she ran. I know she ran. But clues point to something more sinister. There was actually a silhouette of a human body slumped against the wall. Police circle in. Just let it go. Just let it go. But the mystery remains. There was no body, no murder weapon, no, no DNA whatsoever. Was she missing or murdered? Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Shelby Wilkie had always been the kind of woman to take control of her life. She'd always had a plan. And finally, the pieces were all in place. Career, husband, and a brand new baby girl. So when she vanished one January day, the question was, had she been planning that too? And if so, why? As Matt Gutman first reported in 2015, it turned out her perfect life wasn't so perfect after all. And Shelby was in a desperate race to escape before it was too late. New Year's Eve time for new beginnings and new hope. Happy new Year. In the first moments of 2012, while these revelers throng Times Square, Shelby, cute, cute. 38-year-old Shelby Wilkie is having a much quieter evening in a much quieter place, 700 miles south in Asheville, North Carolina. All of New Year's and into the evening was wonderful. We were together and we were happy and just it just was a great time. At the stroke of midnight, Shelby is at home with her husband, Michael. That's them sharing a tender moment in this home video. They'd connected on an online dating site. He was tall, dark, and handsome. She was excited about this guy. He was a great catch, oh, right? Oh, yeah. And I think she called him a Prince Charming at one time. She goes, it's like a Prince Charming. Look at all he does for me, you know, and he's great. A portrait of stability. Wilkie's held down the same job for 16 years in manufacturing. He owns a home, a regular guy who loves the Atlanta Falcons and fantasy football. Yeah, she goes, he's got to be a great guy. 
They live in this two-bedroom ranch in a cul-de-sac on Moody Street, where Christmas has come early. Baby Sydney is born. The daughter, Shelby, had always wanted. Carried her everywhere, wanted to be with her, regretted really having to go to work. She missed her so much, and she just was in love with Sydney. She wanted to be married. She wanted a family. That was her whole goal in life. Shelby has met that goal and surpassed it. While building a family, she is also building a career. Asheville's Mix. Today's best variety. Mix 96.5. As a business manager at 96.5 Asheville Radio Group. Good morning. It's Tammy and Dex with you. What was she like as a business manager? She was very professional. She could be stern. She didn't take slack from anybody. She was a very strong person. Shelby's parents, Jan and Bill Sprouse, say she's been that way since she was in diapers. You knew she was in the room. A force of nature. Yes. yes mm -hmm. Absolutely. Shelby liked to be in charge. Here she is leading the singing at her own birthday party. Happy birthday to you. Your parents describe your sister as the cruise director. Yeah, she kept things organized, kept things on task. She had everything set up, and all we had to do was show up, basically. There's Thomas now. New Year's Day is a Sunday, and the Oregon Ducks are playing the Wisconsin Badgers in the Rose Bowl, while Jan Sprouse texts Shelby, checking in on her daughter and the new baby. I texted her and said, are you okay? And a text came back, yes. It is the last time they will ever hear from her. Sunday and Monday, I was just calling and calling, and I got into a panic of, you know, why she wouldn't pick up. And it's just not like her, because I hear, I hear from her all the time. The swelling anxiety turns the minutes into hours. I couldn't get through to her cell phone anymore because it had been turned off. I had a very, very bad instinct that something had happened to Shelby. One of my coworkers walks into an office and she says, Shelby's missing. I'm like, stop kidding around. She's not missing. She goes, no, really. Her mom's been trying to get a hold of her, and she says she can't reach her. Well, that's bizarre. Monday evening, still no word from Shelby. So Shelby's father and brother head over to the house on Moody Street to see what's up. I asked Michael if he knew where Shelby was, because we haven't heard from her all day, which is strange. But the day started normally, says Michael, who told them she drove to work that morning in her 2012 Ford Escape. So he picked up a cell phone um, and called her work saying, yeah, I'm right here with Bill. He's in the, in the driveway looking for you. Hey, honey, it's me. I'm standing in the yard with Bill and people's trying to get hold of you and you're not returning any calls and stuff. Just uh, call somebody back and let somebody know something. Okay? Well, I love you, honey. Actually, he left a series of messages himself on her office voicemail. Hey, honey, it's me. I can't wait to see you later. Love you, babe. Hey, honey, it's me. I was just calling to say how your day was going. I hadn't heard from you. He also called his buddy, Mark McMinn. He just said that, he, that she'd run off and left, that uh, 